Okay, so I want to start off um, saying that this is, you know, it's under the umbrella of special teams. We're talking organization and things like that, but hopefully all coaches can get something from it. Uh, you know, we're, we're just talking, it's supposed to be week two here at the RMF and, and I, I've got the background of the, uh, background of the RMF in, in the backdrop there uh, with the stand. You can see the field and the field goal post. You know, football's kind of in the air and we're all itching to get going. Um, so what I'm hoping to provide you with is some ideas to help you be prepared for when we do get going. All right, then we can hit it rolling and take advantage of this extra time to come out from this better than you went in. And, um, you know, especially organization and planning ahead of time and different ways to look at things uh, so that you can be rocking and rolling, you're not scrambling last minute. Um, a lot of the stuff that, that I get, um, you know, I've worked with Corey McDermott uh, throughout my career. He's been kind of my main mentor for uh, special teams. And, and even before that, Gary Echeverry, he's someone that, that I look to. And then, you know, we're on phone calls quite often and just picking each other's brain and sharing ideas. And, and it's more so me picking his brain than him picking mine. Um, but that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. But we, we talked about it earlier about going in, and finding mentors and being a mentor and sharing things and getting better together. Um, so, so that's something that I want to share with you right there. But as we start to talk about this, you know, one thing as far as special teams is I would encourage all young coaches or coaches that has, have aspirations, they figure they're ready to take the next step, maybe from an assistant positional coach or uh, to a positional coach or a positional coach to a coordinator. Talk to your head coach about being a special teams coordinator, especially if you're on a team that shares responsibilities. You know, maybe one guy does punt and punt return and another guy does kickoff, kickoff return or you split it up, every coach has one. Everyone does it a, a, a number of different ways. But if you want to take that next step, go ahead and talk to, bring it up with your head coach and give them the idea that you want to take it over and coordinate the special teams. Because number one, it's going to teach you how to be organized. It's going to teach you how to be organized because that's the number one job with special teams. A lot of times you are doing it by yourself or there's a minimal staff uh, that supports you with it as far as your day-to-day -day operations, whether it's film break breakdown or practice scripts and cards and all that kind of stuff. So you have to be organized with all of that stuff. Oh yeah, plus you have to present the ideas to the players and, and get them going and organize your meetings and everything like that. So organization is the main skill for special teams. But if you're able to take on a coordinator role, it allows you to develop and implement your own ideas. All right you get to start to create and build your own system. Take something from somebody else if you have to at the start, but then you start to put your wrinkles on it instead of always being told what the wrinkles are from somebody else or being a part of it. Here, you're the decision maker, things go through you. It gives you a chance to work with the whole team, okay? Um, you're addressing the whole team in meetings, you're, you're, you're working with all different position groups as opposed to combined uh, to being confined to your one small area, whether it's, you know, a running back coach or a DB coach or, or whatever it is. Okay. You get to work with different athletes. All right. And doing so allows you to learn and teach new football skills. You learn and teach new football skills, new techniques, new fundamentals, understanding of how they do things differently, you know, on different sides of the ball. You hear coaches talking about all the time, go spend a year or two coaching the other side of the ball. Well, that's really special teams. You get to do that. You get to open up your, your periphery uh, to the game and be able to learn new things and, and see uh, the big picture. And that pre prepares you for a larger role. Okay, whether it is being a special teams coordinator, or maybe it's you want to use that opportunity to start building your systems because eventually you want to be an offensive coordinator, a defense coordinator, a head coach. But being a, a coordinator in itself gets you to start to develop your own things. And one of the first things that I encourage you to develop is your coaching philosophy. And this is something I'm working on uh, right now, trying to get uh, come out of this thing better than we went in. You know, I'm spending this extra time looking at culture and, and building philosophies and things like that. You know, Coach Hall talked a lot about that in the past. And I know um, other coaches have as well. We had some great talk last night um, uh, about how to 
connect with your athletes from Angus Reed. But, you know, as far as a philosophy goes, I've never really taken the time to sort it out. I kind of had it in the back of my mind, okay? But now I'm actually doing it, all right? And same thing with building a culture of a football team and, and the process on how you're going to deliver that, all right? But I encourage all coaches, doesn't matter who, position coaches, right now, think of why you're doing it, okay? Think about it. Put it down on paper. Write it down. It might be fluid, okay? You could change it. I know I have a million times, and, and what I'll present to you tonight still isn't it probably done, all right? But ask yourself at your core, if we cut you open, what are you all about, okay? What are you all about, and why do you do what you do, okay? So I wrote uh, from pen to paper down, you know, my overall coaching philosophy. It's independent of offense, defense, special teams, or anything like that. But as far as coaches and I put it, uh, or philosophy, I put it down here, okay? And uh, I'm putting it out there in the universe. That's one of the things I wanted to do. You know, first of all, put pen to paper. Second of all, say it out loud and talk about it. And if it changes from day to day, then that, that's fine until you come up with something solid. But for me, my whole philosophy about coaching is to create an environment of success through high expectations, achieved by demonstrating relentless effort in competition and being fundamentally sound with a high level of football knowledge on a daily basis. And some of these trigger words for me, as far as coaching, you know, I'll start with success. Okay. That's on and off the field. It's not specific to football. It's helping people be successful, uh, contributing members of society after they're out of the game. Okay. High expectations, high expectations, come from first within and then are uh, coming from external factors as well. All right. Demonstrating relentless effort in competition, relentless effort. Number one, you hear me talk about that all the time and the ability to translate that when it counts in competition. Compe I want, I want to teach people to compete in the meeting room, on the practice field, in the classroom, in their work with the relationships, everything uh, is about a competition, okay? And we want to be fundamentally sound. That's on special teams. It's if I'm coaching a position with the defensive line or whatever it might be, but a huge emphasis on fundamentals and then learning the game, a high level of football knowledge, okay? Football IQ, a lot of people call it. I usually say football knowledge, all right? But teaching the, the uh, minute details of the game, especially situations, so that we're able to capitalize when those things arrive. And all of that stuff is done on a daily basis. So if you haven't done something like this already, I strongly encourage you, think about your own philosophy, write it down. Doesn't matter what it looks like at the start, you can change it, okay? But start using this time to put some thought into that. And then as far as special teams are concerned, Okay, this is kind of what we're talking about with the Regina, what I'm thinking about with the Regina Thunder right now, uh, as far as our uh, mantra. Okay, I, some people use, you know, um, acronyms and things like that. This year, I want our special teams to focus on competition. That's, that's the message I want to get across. And we're talking about it with some of our players right now in our Zoom meetings and, and things like that. But the, the thing that we are going to focus on this year is compete. And to me, when I think about competing, and this is from the reading I'm doing uh, this off season, you know, I really like this, that the truest form of competition is not versus the opponent. It's about, it, it, it's competing to be the best version of yourself. So reaching your own potential, all right, and striving to be a new benchmark for yourself. So that there, you know, comes from Pete Carroll uh, talking about competition not being versus the opponent, but it's that intrinsic motivation. It's that internal competition. I was talking with our D-line players yesterday. You know, I've started to do some running, okay? I'm a big dude. I'm not gonna set any world records. I'm not gonna look up times for running, but I'm marking my own times. I've got a little sticky note and I put my lap time and my overall time so that at least when I go there, okay, I've got that benchmark that I gotta be better today than I, I am tomorrow or better today than I was yesterday. And that leads into the second point. I will never come second to myself. I'll never come second to myself. 
I always want to win. I don't want to let me down first because anytime I'm letting myself down, you know I'm letting down the people around me, all right? When I'm the best version of myself, the team is the best version of itself. If I'm the best version of me, I'm giving that to the team. If every member on the team is giving their best versions of themselves, the team is better. You know, the last few years, I've been hearing kind of two different sides and it's kind of shifted. You know, the team, the team, the team. I understand all of that. But at the end of the day, you know, sports is about individual competitors. Okay. And, you know, Nick Saban talks about this. The eyes make the team. I have zero things wrong with promoting some individualism. Everyone has their personality. Don't try to put people in a box, okay? Uh, player A is going to be different than player B. You know, we have to find that out and how to work with them. But your eyes make the team, all right? There's no I uh, in team, but there is an I in win, okay? There is an I in win. Okay, so all the eyes make the team. And if you can promote all the individuals to be competing with themselves first, then that's contagious. That brings everybody along, all right? And that triangle at the bottom, again, that's another thing that I'm getting from um, Pete Carroll. And really, it's quite similar to what uh, Coach McDermott and I have talked about these last couple of years, but it's the ability to focus, Okay, to have laser focus on what's going on, live in the moment, execute your job when it's required. Okay, and he talks, Pete Carroll talks about this, this triangle, and it, it all starts with trust. Okay, can we trust you as a player to do your job? Belichick's talking about all that, all, all of that. He's made that famous. Can we trust each individual player in the room to do their job? And if the answer is yes, then now all the individuals know they can trust the people around them, all right? When we can trust ourselves, other people can trust you, and you can trust other people, that leads to confidence, okay? Now, confidence we talked about with our team is the memory of success, all right? Being able to earn something and do it correctly and be successful at it. Not given, you have to earn it. It's got to be difficult. All right, but when you, when you have the trust in everybody, you're able to execute, you succeed, and you have confidence in the people around you, you have confidence in yourself through preparation. And when you have trust and confidence, that allows us to have focus, okay? We can focus on the task at hand. You're not worried as an individual player about, you know, oh, am I supposed to be in this gap or this gap or what's my assignment on this play? You're not worried about the people uh, around you. Can I trust them to do their job or do I have to hold back to, to cover his back? All right. We have trust. Trust leads to confidence. Confidence leads to focus. And when we have a supreme focus, we are able to compete at an extremely high level. And so that's what we want to talk about this year in special teams. And we're going to spend a lot of time on, you know, I call these money words and, and things like that, but we're going to explain, and we've been doing it in the off season uh, to our players. And then now we want to see this translate on the field. When we talk about goals, all right, as far as goals are concerned, we, we like to stick with five, a small number. Okay. We will track other things. And I've mentioned a couple of those things to you in, in previous um, clinics. All right. But as far as goals, we look at five and this is my thought on goals. First of all, they have to be lofty. All right. We're not chucking out goals that are easy to obtain just so we can give everybody a pat on the back. All right. Goes back to competition. You have to earn things. All right. Our goals, we want immediate feedback. All right, you know right then and there whether you've met your goal or not. You don't have to wait for the stats after the game or the next day, all right? And they actually have to have a direct correlation to winning games. Now that's subjective, I, you could argue, but you know, I'll, I'll give you a for instance, is on special teams, I don't talk a lot about, you know, say net punting or punting yards, okay? Because first of all, you have no, nobody's sitting out there and watching the punt go by and then, okay, that's, went to the four, that's 47, 40, 48 yard punt. And then they got a return of five yard, 43 net, right? Everyone raised their hands. You got to wait for the stats after that. Okay. We want to know right then and there during the game, are we meeting our goals or not? 
So for our goals, we got five. We talk about the first one, all right, create takeaways. Our saying in there is two, we're in it, four, we win it. On special teams, we wanna contribute that. That saying right there is more for the team, not for special teams, okay? But if we get two takeaways in a football game, then we should be in and competitive in that game. If we get four takeaways as a football team in that game through offense, defense, special teams, then we should win that game a large majority of the time. So on special teams, we want to contribute that. We want to take that ball away, whether it's forcing a fumble and recovering it, a gadget or a fake or anything like that. The next thing we talk about is goals, penalty-free football. At the end of every play, we know whether we took a penalty or not. Okay, pass or fail. And we especially emphasize return game penalties. Massive yards are, are lost in return game penalties. All right, you could have a punt that goes down to the 10 and you return it for a touchdown and you take a holding penalty. Well, that's darn near 100 yards, depending on where that, where that penalty is taken, of field position and points, okay? So we wanna play penalty-free football, all right? Zero penalties equals goal met. And we definitely don't wanna take uh, penalties in the return game. So we'll teach our techniques to, we call them penalty beaters, you know, to make sure that we don't do that. 100% uh, ball security. So we don't wanna cough up the ball, okay? So every return, we wanna secure it and either score a touchdown, think first down, then touchdown, or get the ball back to the offense, okay? We never wanna give up the play and that kind of give up the ball. And that leads to uh, number four, which is 100% success on fakes. Okay, if we call a fake, we want to be 100% successful on it. Okay, if we call two fakes in a game, we got to go two for two. All right, um, if they run a fake against us, we got to shut it down. All right, so we're 100%, uh, uh, we're batting a thousand for shutting them down any fakes that are run against us. And then the last one, we want to score. We want to contribute to the scoreboard by scoring touchdowns. Okay, by scoring touchdowns in the return game or even in the cover game when you scoop and you cause a fumble and you scoop and score. But all five of these, you know right away whether you did that or not, all right? Now, not all of these may happen in a game and that's fine, okay? It doesn't mean you failed because, you know, um, there were no fakes in a game, all right? But this is the stuff that we're tracking. This is the stuff that we think actually correlates to winning football games. So when you're looking at what, how do your goals match what you want to achieve, these things right here, we think are the best way to do that. Next thing I want to talk to about is uh, connecting and engaging with your players. Okay. So as a special teams coach, coordinator, or an assistant coach, you work with more players than any other position coach or coordinator. And that's just a fact. You work with the whole team. Okay. Um, so you, it's your job to go out there and find what makes these players tick. Okay. What is their skill set and how can you best use it? All right. And you can't do that if you sit in your office. All right. You can't do that if you don't talk to your players, you have to seek them out. You have to engage them. If you're a high school coach, walk the halls. Okay. Talk to them. If, if, uh, you're at a higher level, all right, you might be talking to them in stretch, okay? Meal times, on the road, on buses, all right? But find ways to connect with your players and dig a little bit and find out what these guys are made of and what they like, what they don't like, what they're passionate about. Uh, and You know, you're kind of keeping it specific to football, but what their skill set is. Don't rely on the reputation that somebody else has told you, oh, this player would be good at that position. Okay, well, all along, he felt he was out of position anyways and wants to be doing something else or has never been given the opportunity to try something and wants to do this. So you have to find that, okay? I spend a lot of this time for myself uh, during practice and during stretch. You'll always see me weaving through. I probably get the strength coaches upset, but, you know, I'm talking to the players and I always go directly to the O-line first. It's my fundamental belief. The O-line is the heartbeat of the team. Okay, so I'll go and talk to them and, you know, I'll pick different players. You know, I just want to be talking and engaging with everybody. All right. If you do have an office, lots of people like to say that they have an open door policy. Well, half the time the door is closed. Keep the door open. All right. Text them, ask them to come see you. All right. 
Go sit in the locker room. Go put a note in their locker. Ask them to come see you. But it's our job to develop young players, okay? I believe it's a fundamental responsibility of a special teams coach to develop young players. And that's at any level. There are rookie coming in. They've either just been given to you or someone has recruited them. Somebody thinks highly of them and they should be able to contribute. Doesn't matter if it's the lower level or the higher levels. All right. But we need to develop those young players. All right. Have them earn success on special teams. Make them. And th this is kind of a secret sauce right here. If you can create a culture where it's understood that you have to be an impact player on special teams before you can be a starter on offense and defense, then your special teams are going to go through the roof. All right. You've got people coming in and earning it. It's not special. Oh, I don't want anything to do with special teams. You know, on my birth certificate, it says I'm a middle linebacker. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, your first year in university or high school and you're stuck behind guys, three, four or five years older than you. All right. Get these guys engaged, get these guys engaged on special teams. And if you, you, you talk about it with your staff, you can get your staff to believe in this. All right. And they'll help you promote that. The next thing is language. Yeah. The players and the coaches have to speak your language. Okay. They got to speak your football language. If you use specific terms for something, then you want the players to be talking about it. We'll, we'll talk about field goal here a little bit uh, uh, later, okay? But when we're talking about stopping jumpers to, that are trying to block field goals, you know, I'll ask the, the field goal team all the time, what's the best way to stop a jumper? Stop the penetration, all right? I want them to say that. I don't want them to say step up and punch or any of our other terms right there. How do you stop a jumper? Stop the penetration. That's how. You don't let the penetration get through, which means the jumpers can get closer, okay? And now they're jumping closer to the launch point. But get them using it. Get them using the terms, both players and coaches, of how you call, what you call your techniques. Name your drills, okay? So people know what they're doing. Any phrases, I already kind of used that, the, the phrase example already. And then in the meeting rooms, this is something that I love doing and I think it's extremely valued is have the players change their seats in special teams meetings. All right. I'm not a territorial person by nature and I probably drive people nuts. If I go into a room, I tend to sit in different spots, you know, unless it's a work area. Okay. But you know, if you're talking, say kickoff, all right, have them sit next to the people that are beside them on kickoff. And then all of a sudden you switch to go to punt. Okay. Well, Allow them, encourage it, take a second, switch your seats. So, you know, you get your boundary tackle and your boundary guard sat over here. You get your back row guys, maybe sat behind them, but get them up. It breaks up the meeting a little bit for 10 seconds or however long it might take. And you don't mind that little bit of chatter in your, in your, in your meeting if they're talking football and talking between themselves. And that kind of leads to the next point is welcome and encourage the feedback and the ideas from the players. You will come up with something, you'll create a scheme and a game plan and how you see it in your head that it's most effective to be done. But if, a, and you ask a player, okay, kick off a turn, for example, uh, you know, there's different ways to execute a double team. You could finesse double team it, you could post and drive it, all right? Maybe you might think that you, let's use technique A and the player pipes up and says, hey coach, I think I'd feel more comfortable on this angle if I could do X, Y, and Z. And I say to players all the time, speak up and let me know what you're thinking because you're the one executing it. All right. We'll give you the freedom. 99% of the time, the answer will be yes. Okay. As long as it stays within the scheme and the structure and, and the goals of what we're trying to accomplish, allow these guys to, to implement their, their thoughts because then you go from being interested to being invested. All right. Everyone's interested just because they're there. But if they feel they have some thoughts in, into what's going on and how to execute it, now it means more to them and they become invested into what you're doing. So that's kind of big picture background stuff, you know, that, and really that's coaching in general, okay? So now if we talk about organizing your special teams, all right? When we're organizing our special teams, first of all, get your head coach involved, okay? Get your head coach involved. I'm fortunate right now with the Regina Thunder that the head coach, uh, Scott McCauley, is a big special teams guy. So we know he's going to be involved. The players know he's going to be involved. It matters. And I've worked on different teams with a whole bunch of people. 
And, you know, I've had everything from disinterested coaches to coaches that are real interested in everything in between. But make sure of this, your core beliefs and philosophies must support and echo what the head coach is saying. Okay. You can't be saying one thing and the head coach be saying the other. All right. That's the easiest way to get fired. All right. So make sure your core beliefs and philosophies jive with the head coach and then getting your staff involved. All right. Invite, encourage you, involve the other coaches, involve them, coach them up. Okay. Coach the staff. If you want to get them involved, they want to do right. Okay. So coach them, teach them the drills, whether you teach them in person or give them game clips and show them and talk it through. No coach wants to go on the football field and do a poor job of coaching anything. Okay. So get them involved, coach them up on how to do it and then allow them to put their little spin on it. Okay. With maybe some of their language and things like that. Maybe they've got good technique advice for you on how to do certain things. All right. But get them involved. All right. Give them specific roles and specific directions and engage young coaches, engage young coaches. All right. Young coaches will break their backs for you. All right. Maybe you can give them a larger role because they're, you know, a GA or they're an assistant position coach or something like that, where they can really take ownership of a specific thing on special teams and then watch them run with it. Okay. You do this and your coaches and players will support the teams. And then you also have to know and appreciate who's not going to be involved in special teams. A lot of team that might, that might be the offensive coordinator, or the defensive coordinator. Okay. How much are your QBs involved? Maybe they're holders. Maybe they don't do anything. Or maybe the second or third string is involved. Same with the O-line. Be vigilant with their team they, or with their time. So you'll have them for field goal and maybe hands team or depending on the level, if you sprinkle them in on punt or kickoff return. Okay. And same thing with D tackles. You'll use some of them, but you ain't going to use all of them all of the time. Okay. So, you know, be vigilant with their time. And at the same time, understand if you have multiple coaches at one position. Okay. If you got two D line coaches, for example, one of them can stay with the D line that aren't in special teams for that particular day. And the other one is doing something on special teams. All right. No different if it's a DB coach or whatever it might be. And then as far as the support staff, keep your support staff happy. All right. Equipment people and film people, keep them in the loop. They like to be prepared. All right. There's nothing worse than an equipment guy getting told last second that, you know, I need this or I need that. Or can we switch this? Drives them nuts. Okay. So keep them in the loop. Let them be prepared. I'll show you some scripts and different things like that. Okay. Give it to them ahead of time. All right. Provide them copies of your circuits when and where equipment is needed, what you want film. You can't yell at a film guy if you didn't film it correctly, if you didn't write it down and give it to him. Okay, make sure they understand what you want from them. So here's an example of a coach's duties or coach's roles sheet that we did last year uh, with the Argonauts. Okay, and what we tried to do is involve as many coaches as we can. And our strategy here was to uh, match what they were looking for on both teams. So for example, if I look at, um, let me pick one here. If I look at kind of Coach Avery here on punt, he's looking at, at, at our gunners, okay? And then on punt return, he's also working with the runway, okay? Those corners and halfbacks that are setting that up. On kickoff, he was working our F1 and F3. And on kickoff return, he's working with the guys that are blocking those guys. So you match it up. They get to see both parts of it, all right? But this is something that we give them at the start of the year. They can do with it what they want, whether they paste it, you know, at their workspace or put a picture of it, keep it on their phone. But everyone knows what their responsibilities are. Scout team, there's a couple different ways you can do that, whether you have one guy that does a scout team for everything or you've got different scout team coaches uh, to help you out with that. Okay, you organize it however you want but put it on paper so everybody knows what they're doing. All right, next thing is drills, okay? Create your own drill book. There's been a number of coaches talking about that, okay? But give this stuff to your coaches. If you're doing a circuit and you want them to do this hoop pursuit drill, give your coaches this. This should be in your meetings. It's posted, okay? You put the work behind the scenes in, but your coaches, this is what I want you to do. The first start of the year, you might have to go through it and show it. And here's the film clip. This is what it looks like and all that kind of stuff. Later in the year, you just might be able to put it on their desk and say, hey, we're doing this. Okay. Yep. Got it. I remember that. Good to go. All right. Along with that. Okay. 
uh, copies of your, your field logistics for your circuits, okay? Where their drills are supposed to be. So if I'm asking Coach Avery and Coach Lionello to do the no yards drill, all right, that's station four, this is the area that they're gonna go. Nothing worse if you got 10 minutes for, we all know time is limited with special teams anyways. If you have 10 minutes for, you know, a special team circuit, but it takes two or three minutes to sort your players and coaches out where to go, okay? Have this posted. It's in your meeting. It's posted in the locker room. Give it to the coaches. Give it to the players, all right? Give it to the film guys. Give it to the equipment guys. You can see the film guys' responsibilities are down here. Uh, you've got equipment for every single circuit. So the, the equipment guys know what needs to be there. If you have that ability, okay. Or maybe you've got some extra ha helpers there. It might be your son or, or someone's kid that's there as a ball boy or something like that. All right. You can hand them this sheet of paper and they can go get two hoops, two bullet pads and a pop-up bag and put it there at the 20 yard line, you know, off to the side for station one. Okay. Be organized. And then you've got your drill menu. Okay, do the same thing that you would for your uh, individual positions and do it for special teams. Other coaches have talked about this already. So now let's talk about training camp. So we're getting ready for training camp and we're talking organization and thinking ahead. Okay, think ahead to what you're going to do. So these are some of the must knows before you set up how you're going to run your training camp. You need to know how many total practices or days you have because you might have more than one practice on a day okay you need to know how many periods and what types of periods do you have okay what are the length of those are they all the same length are some different length than others are some shorter are some only walkthroughs okay you have to plan that out and you have to understand that which days in training camp do i not have meetings or practice time all right i'll show you an example of that i'm sure we've all gone through that um, are there days when you have to change location? Okay. We went through this last year where we were changing locations every week for practice, you know, through training camp and, and throughout the year, it was actually a good thing for us. Okay. Because how does that change the location affect you? Do you have to adjust? Are you going to have more field space or less field space? Are you going to have the same type of meeting room or a different type of meeting room? What about field equipment? Is field equipment going? Is it going to be there? Or are you not going to have access to it? So then you can plan what you're going to do on those specific days. Okay. When are you going to gain or lose time by following a team meeting? A lot of the time, special teams follows the coach, the head coach's meeting. Okay. And you need to know and pre-plan for, and hopefully he'll give you a heads up. Hey, I'm going to take an extra 10 minutes for my meeting today. Sorry. All right. You got to be able to make do. All right, he's the boss, it's his, it, it's his uh, right to do that. But if you're prepared in advance, you can do that. Just as many times probably, you know, the team meeting goes just like that. Hey, I'm scheduled for five, I only need 30 seconds. All right, then you can gain some extra time there. Uh, what are the days that you have scrimmages and are special teams involved? If it's a scrimmage day, chances are you're not practicing too much. Are your special teams involved at that scrimmage or are they not involved? If they are, you'll, you'll have to do more prep work, obviously. Okay. Is there anything new or anything identified that's going in in training camp that may need extra attention? Okay. Are you putting in a new punt team or a new kickoff team that might require some extra attention or may require, require more times and periods? All right. Plan that out, especially if it's new. Okay. And then once you understand all that, start from the end and work backward. Start from the end and work backward. Okay, hopefully some of you coaches that are not special teams coaches are looking at this and planning your, your indie sessions and your, your fundamental skills and coordinators the same way. Okay, hopefully you get some value from that, but start at the end and work back. What do I need in by the end of that first week? What do I need in by the end of, or by the start of that first exhibition game if you have one? Or if you have more exhibition games, what do I need by the second one? And then what do I need uh, at, at the end of training camp? Okay, don't start from the front and start sprinkling stuff in. Pick your deadline. I know by this day I have to have X, Y, and Z in and then work backwards. And once you understand all of that, you build your uh, insertion schedule or sorry, you build your, your meeting schedule off your insertion schedule. Okay, and then the number one goal of training camp is to get out healthy. Get out of training camp healthy. So you have to monitor your players. 
no, no football coach or position coach or anyone's going to love seeing, you know, the kickoff team fly down there for 10 reps every single time you're doing kickoff. Okay. How can you adjust your reps so they don't have to be full reps, monitor the health of the players. You know, we've had a couple back to back days or, or power practices, you know, you might need to slow it down the next day. You might need to adjust your reps and then your specialists. Okay. Long snappers included your long snappers, your hunters. Okay. Can you, uh, Find time to take uh, some kicks off a guy's leg, use a judge, judge machine, rotate other guys in there, throw the ball. Same thing with the long snapper. Make sure you get these guys going, okay? If these guys are snapping 100 balls a day, they're going to fatigue. So this here is an example of an insertion schedule for last year. So it's kind of compact here. Hopefully you can get something out of this uh, as, I, as I took it and tried to put it into this PowerPoint. Okay, but in the light blue or the cyan, as Coach McDee would like to refer to it, that is our uh, field time. And in the dark blue, uh, that's our meeting time. Okay, so we're looking at day one here. Then if we go to day two, we've got a morning meeting, we've got field time, and we've got an, after, uh, an evening meeting. Next day, morning meeting, field time, this is what's going on, and then an afternoon meeting. And then all here, it's listed uh, what, what we're installing and what we're reviewing on everything. But as I go down, if I look right here, okay, I've got it written in advance that I've got no meeting that day, that morning. So I got to make sure that the night before, okay, what am I doing here? I'm doing punt return and field goal walkthrough. So the night before, there it is, okay, field goal D in circuits. All right, so that's going in the night before because I don't have a meeting. Okay, don't wait to the day of and then, oh, you, you know, the night before. Oh, I don't have a meeting tomorrow morning. How am I supposed to install this? Okay, you got to think of it ahead of time. You know, you can look through this and I get to the end of week two. This is the first preseason game. But if I break it down, I can see that I've got 10 times where I'm on the field. That's excluding this day before right here. Okay, I know I have 16 meetings, either before or after. And I know there's four times, like the one I pointed out over here, Okay, where there's no morning meeting. And then I can see that and I can plan and I can start to insert uh, the things that I need to get done. And then uh, make sure you go through training camp and you have your situations. You gotta be prepared for situations um, in all phases. I, gave, I, I, I took this out of one of my documents and, and uh, put this on here for field goal situation, okay? You, in special teams, you have to teach this stuff. That's part of the football knowledge that, that I explained earlier. All right. You got to be comfortable in these and you got to practice it. If they ice your kicker and he, he misses the kick and you've never practiced it in practice about, you know, during the cadence, stopping the play and either moving them back for a penalty or just, you know, redoing it. Okay. Then you can't be upset that it happens in a game. All right. If you don't practice it, you can't expect it to be done properly. So specific to field goal, you know, are you practicing clock control? Okay, milking it as we refer to it, getting the snapping that ball at three seconds or two seconds, whatever you like to do. Offense and defense all the time is worried about the, the clock. Okay, make sure we focus on it on special teams too. Varying your snap count. I talked about icing the kicker. Your tackle over your extreme line, make sure you rep that. Do you have a speed cover team or not? Okay, do you, some people call it Hawkeye. All right, you have to be able to understand the transitions between that, okay? Are you going over the rules in your particular league about uh, a block kick and a block that's tipped and still crosses the line of scrimmage versus a block that stays behind the line of scrimmage? When can you jump on that ball and when, when do you have to give five yards, all right? Are you practicing, take, some coaches like to take that end of game field goal on second down. Well, if there's a bad snap, you can down it and go on third down, provided there is a uh, clock time there. And on a bad snap on third down, well, you've got your fire. All right. You got to practice your fire. You got to give them reps every week. Okay. If it's only one rep, then it's only one rep. But don't go a month without doing fire and have it happen in a game and say, why can't we get that fire call? Okay. Are you practicing field goal as a punt? Maybe your punter gets hurt. Or maybe your long snapper gets hurt. And you don't have a guy that can go back there. The only thing you can do is kick a field goal. Okay. So you might want to just kick it into the boundary. It has to be within the rules uh, for your league about where the change of possession is and all that kind of time. Could be just something like a big win and you want to drive the ball instead of having it punt and, uh, and hang up in the wind. Kick for a single, okay? 
Uh, you might go, you know, your the strength of your formation into the boundary and try to kick it out the back of the end zone. Keep in mind it's an extra 20 yards or try to kick it outside. And then the onside field goal and kick out situations at the end of the game, or sorry, onsides and fakes and kick out at the end of the game or the end of the half. The other one I think I skipped over here is practice what happens with too many men. And uh, if you're short players, if you're too many men, where do they have to run off to? Can they run off the field anywhere? Can they only go through the sidelines? If it's only the sideline, do they have to go through? What happens if both benches are on the same side? You know, the rules are different in different leagues, okay? But we'll practice a lot is I'll just keep a guy out of the huddle practicing being short player. If you're short a player, you need to know who. Just don't say we're short 40 yards away. You need a position and a name, okay? So you can get that guy on and then, but the play clock is running. So I'll usually grab a guy, you know, once a week or once every couple of weeks and hold them back. You know, they're in the huddle and um, I'll start the play clock. And they'll figure out, okay, this guy's missing. Okay, Jackson's got him again. And then, you know, 13, 12, and I'll let him go. Uh, nine, eight, seven. It's all running. You know, now that's pressure on the kicker too. He's got to get in there, get a line, get set. No illegal procedure penalties. And the kicker is kind of waiting. And so it gets a pressure situation for him too. But make sure you can excel at the different situations. As we go to practice, all right, I'll go quickly through this. Uh, this is kind of a, a working template that we're talking about with the Thunder right now. Um, so here's what I would like to suggest to you for practice, okay? Have multiple periods per practice. I prefer to have no longer than 10-minute periods. I don't like 15 and 20-minute periods. It's too many people standing around, okay? Keep them crisp. If you have two 15s, can you change it into three tenths? Can you make that work with your practice, okay? Always try to have something um of a special teams drill period okay if you're able to do that could be once a week or you could shave time off of uh your periods in, you know while the scout team is getting ready or are you getting some drill work in as well but if you can get one period specific to special teams drills uh and fundamentals then that w w is fantastic and that's for any level really okay but you can see the other thing here is if you can, do your teams more than once, okay? Don't practice punt once a week and then expect your punt to be effective. It's the most important special team. So we'll start our week here with punt, okay, and go kick off. And then you can see the next day, all right? We've got a second punt period, so it's a little shorter, all right? Um, and then we've added in, you know, you've got your punt return, okay? The other thing here as I'm looking at it, <coughs> and it's reminding me, is I, I'm not a big fan of field goal periods, all right? I prefer to kick the field goals throughout practice. You might have one period and it can be short, five, eight minutes, something like that, okay, where you're installing your fakes and you're working on a couple of things and, and different things like that. But you can have your field goals, you know, like here versus the defense at the end of a team period, okay? And at the end of skelly periods, just send the operation in there. A long snapper, a holder, a kicker, and somebody to be a returner while everyone else is transitioning. Because if Skelly's going on, probably run games over there. But you have this stuff going through at the end of the periods. There's nothing worse than having a field goal period at the end of practice. Practice is done. Okay, everybody, we're going to sit here and kick five or ten field goals. Okay? So it's a lot better. Plus, it keeps your specialist engaged. Okay? It's more game-like for them. Special teams is all one-play drives. Okay, so they get to come on the field, make their kick, and get off. And they can do that multiple times throughout. Okay, third day here, again, splitting it up. So you can see this would be a second punt return opportunity for us. We've got our kickoff return here, and you've got your field goals throughout the day. Okay. Then as far as a script, make sure you script things. So here's an example of a script, script back when we were in uh, Edmonton, okay? So all your script should have your depth chart on there. And then uh, we're a big color uh, coding system kind of thing for us, how things hit our eyes with Coach McDermott and myself. So you can see the first rep in red, there's no card needed. We're just taking a safety in this particular day. Okay, we'll do that on air while the scout team's getting ready, okay? The black lettering signifies to us here that we've got uh, the group twos that are in, okay? Your group twos, your backups, okay? 
And then you can see on here, you've got the down or sort of the, the yard line, the vertical field position, the horizontal field position, where you're going there. And then over here, I like to, because I've spent a lot of time in my career working with the scout teams, is I also like to have the scout card on there and maybe something written about what to expect on that particular scout card. What I mean by that is, you know, if this scout card only says, you know, green four, you know, well, what does it look like? Okay. So here I know, okay, there's a double overhang to the boundary. So I maybe I, as a coordinator, I want my eyes looking for something in particular. All right. And then you've got whether it's a full rep, okay, full cover, or if you're going to kick only or hard 10 or whatever uh, you, you might call that there. Depth charts, this is a working depth chart here. So you can make sure that you're posting this. It's in your meetings, it's in the locker room. Okay, day one, you know, we'll only post stuff uh, for the teams we're working on. So if say it's punt and kickoff day one, well, this would be blank, all of this would be blank. Maybe your field goal team's on there, but you just keep adding to it as the day goes. And then, uh, or as the week goes, but then you, you can build off this. I know I'm talking with Coach McCauley. He's got an Excel system that might be even better than this PowerPoint system where you don't have to transfer things. So I'm going to look into that uh, this year and see if we can utilize that as well. Okay. This is just the opposite side of that depth chart there. All right. Now getting into game prep. So this is for um, our game book. So I just took a, a, a sample of it. At the end of the week, give your players something. We always like to joke about if we get hit by a bus on the way of the game, okay, the players, as long as you got that book, you can go ahead and execute the game plan. Everything you need to know to win the football game is right there. That book uh, with your compete level and your talent is all you need. So we like to highlight players, okay. Um, you know, this particular week we were highlighting Curly Gittins. I think he was going to be a primary returner for us. He was a rookie last year fantastic young man okay and then you know I, I just took out a kickoff return section so there's your your depth chart and your play calls for that week all right give some information about the opponent all right so you know Liram here who I had the opportunity to work with in uh, 14 in Winnipeg I think he just signed a contract in the NFL with the LA Rams maybe uh, or somewhere in California so that's fantastic for him you're providing their best players in a previous clinic, I talked about our tackle quota, but you're giving names and numbers and positions and you know they're leading tacklers on their kickoff team that we have to block up so the guys have an idea about that. All right, you give them a kick chart, okay? You know, you use these kick charts, especially for the returners, all right? You know, if all of their kicks are off here on this right hash and are going somewhere over there, you know it's gonna be a relatively easier day. All right, Hamilton's not the case, all right? They move the ball all over. So we can see not a lot outside the numbers, as you can see, but you know, they've got a surprise on onside kick in the last handful of games, or it could be earlier in the year that we just include. But over here, some information in particular to the kicker, you know, how, what's his average kickoff distance? What yard line should the returners stand? Or what, what yard line is that ball coming down on? So yeah, okay, that's great. He's got 62.7 yard average, but tell the players, don't expect them to know tell the players where that is. So that's the 12 yard line. So maybe he wants to set up at the 10 or the eight or whatever it might be. Okay. And then, you know, for kickoff return, you're giving them a little bit about their personnel, body types, different things like that uh, and where they're coming down and how, and what their lanes look like. This is an example of their kickoff team. You know, you'd be highlighting if they, what they are doing here with any twist. Okay and a little bit of, of kind of game plan notes in the side there. And then you can take some still shots. Uh, and what we like to do with the writing in here is you can write about it and describe it, but ask questions, okay? All of these things here should end in questions. So when players are going through it, they can be general questions, all right? Or they can be a combination of general and specific to different positions or, or players but ask questions with this stuff, get them thinking. You're already highlighting something, but get them to think about different things as, as they're reading through it. And then after the game, you know, what can you track, okay? We like to track so the tackles. So, you know, in the post game meeting, we'll have the tackle, the leading tacklers of the game, leading tacklers of the season. 
Uh, you know, people don't want to be on this middle column. You know, we'll track at, at times uh, or in some seasons, uh, uh, my man made the tackle, okay? If your guy made the tackle, then it's on here. Everyone sees it, you know, kind of bringing that competitive juices into it as well. Um, and then we track that for the season and then penalties, okay? We talked about it. That's one of our five goals in this particular game. We met that goal, zero penalties. And then as far as game day organization, I brought some stuff here. You know, I tried to bring some props or something like that. But if you're working with the scout team and your cards, you know, something good like this is one of these five-star binders uh, I'll use to organize the cards. And the reason I brought it is kind of to show, you know, inside where you, where you can use your, your uh, well, I don't even know what they call these things, these laminate things here. But you use the what your your protectors. That's what they're called. Okay. But use the ones with the flaps. Okay. Use the ones with the flaps. So when it rains and snows and different things like that, you are able to protect your papers. Ink doesn't start to run even in wind. Right. We've all opened a book. This one has a zipper. Okay. So you can close it. Pouch in the front if you have hats and different things like that. That you got to go in there. But that's for practice. And then for game day. You know, that game book that I just showed you will be in a binder. It'll always be the same color, shape, binder. Usually keep it by the kicking net, okay? So if players have questions throughout the game, you know, they don't even need to talk to the coach. They can go grab something uh, or grab the, the binder, check it out, find the section, boom. They can answer the question on their own if they need to. And then as far as what I like to keep with me, you know, I'll keep a selection of specific plays, in, you know, in my pocket, use one of these big, bigger rings here. So it's laminated, you can fold it up. And these are things like kickoff and kickoff return, for example, where you're huddled on the sideline and you can show a play sheet, okay? You might have like a punt fake or something in there, uh, where, or sorry, not a fake, um, a block. You know, if there's injuries, they might know the system, but the block might be different, right? So hands and onside is the perfect thing to have right in your hand at all the time, at all times. And then as far as, um, keeping track of things, you know, we'll have uh, our game call sheet, okay, on here. I'll like to uh, write some information to confirm about the opponent. 99% of the time, it's what we already know, but the number of the kicker and the punter, you know, the holder, uh, the long snapper, okay, do they have two different kickers, you know, one punter, one kicker? Uh, do they have different long snappers? So you're looking for people on and off. Is their holder a guy that is, you know, a quarterback or a receiver that's on the field or is he all coming over? So you can use that information, write it down so that you have it. Okay. And uh, it'll help you identify personnel. And then at the top, you know, I, I usually put things like uh, the timeouts and challenges. If you have those in your leagues, you know, you need to be organized. Okay. A lot of times the head coach will look over to you to say, hey, how many timeouts do we have and challenges and different things like that. Okay and you can write down your play calls so you're not guessing after the game, all right? And then the other thing, you know, it's just your, your ready list and uh, your depth chart. And on the depth chart, you know, I'll, I'll use it for circling injuries and different things like that, scratching guys out so that it, it's there available. And the best thing that I wanted to show you on this is this little beauty, okay? Some of you might not big, be a big deal and others that I've seen in the past will be like, oh, that's awesome. You know, you get one of these little things, clips on your belt buckle, little thing here so you can keep it together and then you can just hang it off your side, all right? And then uh, look at it, let it go, all that kind of stuff right there. Sheets are laminated so they got a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of weight to them. Okay, that's it for organization. Um, I'm hoping uh, that that was uh, some value for you guys, especially, you know, like I said, even if you're a position coach or a coordinator, you're on the sidelines, you're thinking of game day, what do I need to do? You're thinking of practice, how do I want to organize my reps and all that kind of stuff. And then quickly here, I'll go through the field goal uh, with you. Hopefully I can do this and not to is definitely be faster uh, than what we just went through. But when we talk about field goal, Philosophy is easy, score points. Every time field goes on, we score, okay? Or we convert a fake into a first down or it scores itself, okay? As far as a huddle is concerned, our center will set the huddle and our center will give the strength call, 
Okay, we call it lucky Ringo. If it's strong left, it's lucky. If it's uh, strong right, it's Ringo. So the center sets the huddle, sets it away from the kicker. Okay, so let the kicker set up. Don't set it right behind the ball. Set it off to the side, five, six, seven yards. Okay, and then you can move to the ball after you break the huddle. Once the huddle is set by the center or the long snapper, then the holder makes the calls. Okay, or if that holder is on the field, he'll you'll give it to someone on the sideline, they'll give it to the holder and he still makes the call. And when he makes the call, it has to be with eye contact, okay? That's a big one, all right? Make sure he's looking people in the eye, okay? We always huddle on field goal. Some people won't, but we always do because if there's a fake on field goal, you don't all of a sudden want to huddle, okay? Because that's a tell. Um, then we talk about alignment for our field goal team. So how we do this, okay, is from end to end, we want them to be as tight to the football as possible, okay? There's nothing worse than on field goal team where your guards are kind of close to the ball and your tackle set up a little further back and your end set up a little further back and it's creating that cup right away. Well, you're just inviting more pressure to come in, all right? So we try to teach our guys to get your helmet or your hand down as close to the football as you can, all right? And then we talk about our anchor foot. So from end to end, the outside foot, that's your anchor foot, that's your up foot, that doesn't move, okay? And you drop your inside foot, okay? And we are stepping up to, uh, with our inside foot to the man inside, all right? So we'll tell our guys they can have up to a four inch split, Okay, that's a pretty big split. Most of them will be smaller. But what we do not want to do is start interlock. We want to step to interlock or we want to step to the heel of the man inside. Okay, the tighter you get, the shorter your edges are. All right. So if you're already starting interlock and you squeeze inside and move your post foot. Okay, now everything is your, your edges are, 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 uh, are shortening. Okay. And then the wings, it's flipped for them, okay? Their inside foot is their anchor foot, and their outside foot is their drop foot, all right? So, for example, that boundary wing in this picture here, his right foot, and these pictures aren't necessarily to scale, okay? They're going to be tilted 45 degrees, all right? That right foot will be slightly inside and slightly behind the boundary end. He'll be tilted at about 45 degrees. His left foot would be dropped a little bit back. Okay, and so he can work his double bump technique and I'll explain that as we go. And then when we go tackle over, okay, we do tackle over. Some people do guard over, okay? But just a reminder for that guy, all right, he will come over and now his feet will switch. I guess I should say, we choose to have our linemen, okay, stay right and left. So for example, if they're normally a left side of the line uh, with their left hand down, they will now be a right side field goal team, okay? Uh, so they will continue to stay in their same stance, okay? Some people go field and boundary, nothing wrong with that. That's just what we like to do. Really, it depends on what your O-line does. Are they left and right? Are they field and boundary? All right, moving forward here, I'm not definitely not going through all of this stuff here, all right? But I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. We expect our kickers to make all of them, but we're gonna cover as if they're missed. Okay, we expect them to be made, but we're going to cover as if they're all missed. All right. So down here, okay, as far as that line, what we, our cues are is we want to shut the inside gap. All right. We want to shut the inside gap. That's rule number one. So you get down, you are in a three-point stance. There is no two-point stances on field goal team related to short yardage. Get down, get your hand in the dirt, and get ready to step up and punch. That's our team. That's our key. We want to step with our, we want to punch with our hands. We don't like a lot of flippers, okay? Get your hands involved, all right? So you can grab and hold a little bit as well. You are responsible also for half of your outside gap. So if I'm the left guard, the long snapper is right here, I'm stepping up and punching to shut my inside gap but I'm also responsible for half of my outside gap. Teaching that will also help uh, prevent them from sliding that post foot and getting two feet on one where, or two hands on one guy and opening their back gap. 
okay? Using your hands allows you to create a little bit of separation, a little bit of power maneuvering so you don't get pulled, all right? And when we're talking uh, our wings, okay, our boundary wing and our swing, we'll double bump that, okay? So what I mean by that is they're tucked in behind the, behind the boundary wing is behind the boundary end and the swing is behind the field wing, okay? And they will, our, our coaching point is let the momentum from the inside guy take you to the outside guy. Let the momentum of the inside guy take you to the outside guy. So what I mean by that is this, is if I am the boundary wing, okay? Center's over here, so I'm on the left side of the line. My inside foot is up, my outside foot is my drop foot, and I've got a corner and a half back, both coming off my edge that I'm responsible for, okay? I definitely don't want to lunge outside, okay? Uh, and open that inside gap, okay? There are systems to do that, but they, they do different things up front to allow that to happen, okay? So I want to make sure because I'm already angled, the momentum when I, when I shut that inside gap allows me to drift back and I'm punching the hip of the outside rusher. Don't reach early. Let the, the, the outside rusher is further. He's got further distance to come, which should make it uh, a longer longer time. So if they're both coming the same pace, and you got to scout that out because they'll, they'll, they'll play with you a little bit. But if they're both coming at the same pace, let the momentum of the inside guy take you to the outside guy. And then this next thing here at the bottom is for the kicker, place the T. This is Canadian football, not American. Place the T uh, behind the heel or just inside the heel, uh, the inside heel of the field guard, okay? And with that said, I want to see if I can bring this up real quick. Uh, where did it go? Coach, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So this is the American game. They play with 11, we play with 12. So a lot of times you will see that T directly behind the midline. Okay, their protection is sound. They've got one, two, three, four and a half guys to this side, and they've got one, two, three, four and a half guys to this side. If you do that in the Canadian game and you put the T directly behind, all right, you have to remember we've got an extra guy. So now you've got one, two, three, four and a half with the center protecting to the left as we look at it and to the right. You've got one, two, three, four, five and a half guys, all right? Your protection is unsound. You have less guys over here. So what you want to do is put that T just inside the, the inside heel of the field guard. Now your protection is balanced. One, two, three, four, five to one side and one, two, three, four, five five to the other side. You have to teach your guys that. No different, and it's the exact same thing in tackle over. If you go tackle over, okay, and you still, I wouldn't imagine too many people would do this, but for argument's sake, if you still kept your T on the midline, that's what it would look like. Three and a half to one side and a whole bunch to the other. I don't think a lot of people would do that, all right? But they might still keep their T here. Your T should actually go behind the outside foot or just inside the outside foot of that field guard now. So you've got one, two, three, four, five to one side there. One, two, three, four, five. Your, your, your protection is balanced there. But I wanted to give the visual to that because a lot of times, especially new coaches or young coaches don't understand that. And they simply look to uh, the American game, which we all watch a little bit more. Uh, and they just put the T right behind, okay? But you can cause injury. You're leaving a short edge on that boundary side. Okay, I apologize for this. There's two slides here that when it transferred to uh, PDF that it made these long lines, but this is our coverage. Okay, I'll try to speed up here. Um, what we do for our coverage is our center and our two, our, our boundary end and we call it the first guy out here, but for argument's sake, it's the swing. They are our attack players, or scrape players. That center is going to the ball to cut it off in the direction that it's going. And then the other guys that are supporting him would be the boundary end and the swing. Or if the field wing gets out before the swing, they will uh, switch jobs, okay? 
And then from the inside, we start with the uh, O lineman and the field end. Okay, that's that roll of spikes. Give him, give him an analogy. You know, I was just watching Better Call Saul or whatever a couple of weeks ago, and they put the spikes out to, to uh, you know, pop the tires of the car as it was going down the highway. But that's what these guys are doing. So when all things are even, it's an average area kick or distance kick. We'll say put the roll of spikes at the tent. So that field end, he's setting up halfway between the numbers and the, and the uh, hash, okay? The tackles go to the hash mark, and the guards go to the upright. They are the roll of spikes. We've got our three attack players and our two second contain players that funnel everything back inside. So what I don't want to do is send offensive guards and tackles into the end zone, chasing guys, creating different levels, okay, where they're not going to be able to catch anybody anyways. Get to your landmark, shuffle laterally as the ball goes from one side to the other. We'll funnel everything back in. Then they can be part of the tackling. And then obviously you've got your holder and your kicker. They are involved in coverage. Don't have them back there celebrating or sulking. Get them in part of the coverage. They're a safety, a third level for us, okay, uh, and holder to the field, kicker to the boundary. And our second contain, our boundary wing, and the second guy out here, they are uh, keeping everything inside and in front, okay? And they should be a good, you know, kind of five yards behind that first wave. And then anytime it changes directions, go with defense. We talked about that. Don't loop it and take the long way around. And then our fire call here, uh, how we do with the fires, we want kind of elephants on parade, old school outside zone, running the rail, Okay, you hear fire, fire, fire. We want the line. They always go to the lucky Ringo side. And we, we want them to do that to take the defense with them. Okay, as if it's a fake or something like that. Clear it out. All right. And then in a perfect world, your holder is just going to be able to recapture the ball and get it to that boundary end right there. That's our first read. So it could be a hot uh, yard out or sorry, in. Uh, I said five yards. It's seven. Okay, but he should be looking for it right away. And then his job, this is read number one, is to mirror the eyes of the holder. So if everything is perfect and we're able to do exactly what we want and the opponent can't do anything to stop us, which we know never happens, all right, we want that pass completed right over the midline of the original line of scrimmage, okay? If, for example, the holder has to run out here, he matches it and he goes to the boundary side. Field side, it's a high to low concept, look high first. You've got the corner from the swing five yard out uh, from the field wing and an arrow route there. And they, we've got the backside boundary wing. He's got the arrow route, kicker cut it off. Okay, so before I do this. Okay. Field goal cover diagram, okay. More chat. Is there any reason why the boundary end and the field wing are the second level dudes? But the boundary wing and the swing are hard contained. From memory of the last slide. Okay. So what we want, first of all, the reason is for, uh, so it can be balanced, okay? The reason it is that it can be balanced. Let me see if I can go back. Uh, can I go back? There we go. Okay. So we want it to be balanced. Generally, these guys are at second level, okay? So, and they could be getting double teamed a lot of the time. So chances are at least one of these guys will be the second man out, all right? So we want the first guy to get out there and be a scrape player. And he is most likely going to be a much more athletic player than the field end. The field end is a bigger body, okay? Could be an O lineman or a very big D lineman or something like that because more of the pressure is coming from the field side. So this guy should be able to get out and be a little bit more athletic, okay? 
To the boundary side, you tend to have a little bit more of a uh, better athlete here. It could be a defensive end uh, or a more athletic big man, and he can get out faster where, the, again, this guy could be getting double teamed. He's already at the second level. Uh, he's got to deal with the double bump and all of that kind of stuff. So it should be a lot of times they'll let this guy go anyways. He's first out. This is a more athletic guy out of these six. Okay, this is probably among the least athletic guys. Okay, and uh, one of these two guys is going to be first out and the other one's going to be second out. That's how we do it. Take one guy from the second level only and make him a straight player. The other two guys that are second level are going to be second contained players. Um, this here, before I show the, the huddle film, uh, I do, this is day one of training camp. I don't have the other two drills. Okay, we were sorting some things out through day one. But right now what's happening is this is the O-line working uh, on day one field goal. And then you've got your boundary end and boundary wing. They're outside the numbers over there. And you've got your field end, field wing, and swing. Uh, they're outside the numbers to the far side. Okay, but here we're, we're just teaching step up and punch. That's all we're doing right now. Um, so you can see here where the T is. It's not going to be there for all of them. It is day one, but we're just teaching these guys. We're separating it. It's in small groups. We got the pad out there. Okay, getting these guys comfortable with the spacing. You can see the spacing right here. They're not to interlock. Okay, it's always going to tighten down as they go uh, throughout the season but we want to start a little bit wider, okay, uh, to make sure that we don't shorten those edges too much. And really that's dependent on, on uh, how sound you can be with your protection inside. But we give them a target, okay, good pad level uh, and making sure that they're responsible to shut the inside gap and still responsible for half the outside gap. And then coaches as well out here, uh, but outside the numbers would be the boundary end and the boundary wing. They're working their responsibilities. And then out here would be your field wing, uh, field end and your swing. They're working their responsibilities just to get some more reps. Um, going back to this one. Okay. So this should be quick now. Okay. So we talked about coverage. Now let's get, now you got to coach it. Okay. First thing you notice, head coach. We're working tackling and coverage with the offensive lineman. That's coach chain. Okay. He cares. He's in there watching. All right. So here, all the defensive coaches in the room are going to look and say, that's an ugly uh, tackling position. Okay, but of course it is. These guys don't know how to tackle. That's why when you get gas for a, a field goal or a touchdown on a missed field goal, you got these guys reaching all outside their frame and unbalanced and things like that. So we take them through and we drill them and give them opportunities to practice that. Doesn't have to be uh, perfect, but it, it gets better as we go. All right, you've got your old lineman in here. You've got, this is a rookie long snapper, getting him some opportunities in there. Okay, get your quarterbacks involved if they're, if they're starters. This was our starting quarterback and our holder. Okay, uh, so that's uh, him getting his reps. You can see a form a little bit better there. Maybe uh, Coach Hall won't like the hands too wide like that. Okay, but he's getting in there. He's getting involved. So we're working some tackling there. Okay, some other receivers that don't play special teams. This is Jimmy Ralph. He's a holder. Okay, he's not on too many cover teams or anything like that. But he's holding on field goal. He's got to be able to tackle. As we continue on, now we're working uh, open, open space. Okay. So we're doing near foot shimmy. That's what we were coaching in Toronto this last year. Uh, eyes, hands, feet. Okay. And making sure that these guys are coming to balance. You can come to balance however you want. But come to balance in a way that you're going to be able to change direction. So same thing here, we're going in singles here, okay? Look at the finished position from offensive linemen. This is pretty darn good, okay? And they don't mind doing this. I was actually surprised. They didn't think they'd like it too much, all right? But now we send them out in pairs, okay? So do your job, stay on your landmark. 
So for example, here, these are the field side guys going to the field upright and the field hash, okay? And I had the returner juke back a little bit. If I was to see both of these guys vacate too much, all right, then they wouldn't be doing their job. They're getting to their landmarks and the guys that would be over here on this side will funnel it back to them, okay? They come to balance near foot shimmy and finish in a good athletic tackling position. Same thing here, we're working uh, the left side of the line, okay? One's to the upright, one's to the hash, get them to make the move in space, get them used to it, breaking down, lowering center gravity, come to balance so they can change direction a little bit more, all right? Then we'll put all together. So we'll put all four of them together. This is actually one of those field ends that I talked to you about earlier, okay? Former defensive lineman, he's going to his uh, – uh, split in the hash and, and numbers landmark, okay, realizes it right away. But get these guys, we'll give them the landmark that's supposed to be their 10-yard line, okay? You, you, there's no seams. You can see them doing it, and they get the feel of moving in space. They get the feel of moving in space, coming to balance, near foot shimmy in this case, okay, and staying in their landmark, all right? If all of a sudden – they get out here and I see 50 fold over too much. That's not going to be good. So why do you do all this stuff with your old lineman? Okay. Because if you don't, you get gas just like this. Okay. I don't mind showing bad tape. It's honest. Okay. But we get gassed here on uh, opening game of the year. We lost a lot to a little. Okay. Including giving up a special teams touchdown here. All right. But what's the why? Okay, why do we get gassed? First of all, is poor effort, okay, and poor coaching, all right? All those clips that I showed you and some more that I will show you happened after, okay? It was reactive, not proactive. Going forward, I'd like to do it ahead of time, okay? But you look at effort here at the field tackle position, okay, not getting out and covering, okay? That's poor coaching on my part. In training camp, I didn't do a good enough job. That's not too bad here as far as getting to the upright he could be over here. We're on the hash, all right? But we create our seam right there and no effort to get off a block. Plus, we got another guy being double teamed, okay? We do okay, but we don't, we're not covering as a unit. So, what's it? You know, this is a little bit better of a picture on what it's supposed to look like. So, the camera's a little bit wonky here on this angle. It goes down here, okay? But watch uh, when the camera pops back up. First of all, you've got active hands getting off blocks, okay? Now, again, need to work a little bit more coming to balance, but as you look at the O-lineman, there's the hash mark, there's the upright, there's the upright, he's working to the hash mark, there's your field end, okay? And now you've got your straight player coming in to make a tackle, all right? So what we want to do is get these guys in their position and funnel everything back inside. The other thing we'll do is block destruction with the O-line, help them get off blocks. So this is clear and toss. So what we want to do is when you have your hands on the guy, step one way, make him think you're releasing that way, step outside his frame. And when he tries to get you, then you uh, chuck them, you toss them in that direction and release the opposite way. So you can see the hands adjusted. You can see a rip here from the edge on the left of the screen, step outside the frame, get them going that way, release out. And then what does it look on game film? Take a look at the boundary guard. So we're looking right here. Hands on, step clear, toss with a rip. Okay, a little bit of club arm over. All right, then point this out on film. If you don't point it out on film, they'll stop doing it. Another one here is a reverse forklift. The key on the reverse forklift is this, high elbow. Elbow goes straight up and then you go straight down, okay? It's not necessarily an arm over. That guy's got a huge lock on you, very strong. So it's high elbow, straight down. Then you can rip and go arm over after that. But you can see uh, we get the second guy in here on this side doing a very good job. High elbow, rip off it, okay? The returner who's super athletic in this particular picture, takes it easy on them, doesn't make them run too much. But again, look at their finish. Near foot shimmy, eyes to the hip, okay? 
Now we can see at you. So take a look at ripping off the block here with the field guard. Hands on, rip off, and go. Field goals made, but still point it out. Point out positive stuff. You get a field guard club arm over right here. Okay, protection is always first, club, arm over, get off, and go. Cover every kick, cover every kick. All right, how do you stop uh, jumpers? By stopping the penetration. So let me back this up. Remember what I said before about hands and helmets as close to the football? That ball's right on the 20 yard line. And I'll end with this right here, these last two clips. Is the, the story behind this is a previous, this is a PAT. So the previous play was right there, okay? They jumped offside. How'd they jump offside? Because they had Willie Jefferson, number five, try to time the snap count and jump over the center. And we game planned it, would like to think that we, were, we would be able to stop it, but he's a heck of an athlete, okay? He went too soon, five yard penalty, move, uh, move up five, okay? Now he's not gonna jump the center, but he's still jumping. We identify it, formation identification. I don't use a numbering system. We call out formations, okay? And we talk to each other on how to do that. So now, if these guys, maybe that tackle's a little bit too far back, which has the end back. But everyone else is pretty darn good right there. Now check out what happens to the jumper, okay? Look where he's jumping from. He's jumping from a good yard back from the line of scrimmage. This guy jumped here and went forward, so it's not gonna be as high but he's wider anyways, all right? That's, you wanna stop jumpers, stop the penetration, and it starts with your alignment. Look at the work put in here by Tyler Holmes, number 57, okay? He's the right guard as we're looking at. Boom, hands involved, punch with your hands, okay? Shut the inside gap, half the outside gap. Shut the inside gap, half the outside gap. We don't have any outside gap here, so he's leaning a little bit, but not dragging his post foot. But that's a darn good job here, especially when it's that guy who's one of the most freakish athletes to ever play in the CFL. Okay. This is that double bump. So I didn't have access to all my film and I couldn't find a good one to show you uh, uh, when I was looking quickly. But this is one done on air. So look at the boundary wing working his craft. So he doesn't get a rush here, but I want you to see what he's doing. Let the momentum of the inside guy take you back to the outside guy. It is not at the same time. It's not snap of, snap of the ball and do this, okay? You have no power. You're not going to block anybody. That's reactive, okay? We want to be able to attack. So he's here without a rush. Shut the inside gap and then double bump and look to the hip. Go low, not high. These guys are dipping. If you aim for the hip and they're dipping, you'll probably get their shoulder. All right, uh, tackle over, I put this on here, okay? If that was a normal field goal, we would have that here. This is a tackle over, so the angle's a little bit off, but you can see we want it kind of inside the outside leg. We, what we say is we don't want it any closer than the brown star of that guard, okay? Any closer than the brown star of the guard is too short. You're creating too much of a short edge for this guy uh, to come and get it. And then you gotta teach your guys that most of that pressure on a tackle over will be coming right there. And that's it. So hopefully you guys got something from that. My information is up here. Okay, you can get at me on Twitter at DMA Jackson or on uh, email. Uh, I'll be happy to talk with you and help you out any way I can. Then I always like to include some other resources. So these are other people, it's free. Okay, on Twitter, Teams Talk, they're doing a great job uh, of posting stuff on there. Look them up for special teams. Fourth Down University, if you're responsible for coaching specialists or want to know more, long snapping and especially kicking and punting, okay, you can look them up. The AFCA, uh, it's almost the end of April now, but all of April has been a free access to their library. Okay, so the login for that is AFCA, all caps. And then the password, lower cap or lowercase is library. And then Glazier Clinic. So Coach McCauley does a great job. Uh, he's got the Thunder hooked up with the season pass for Glazier Clinics. And doing that, you also get, uh, if you want to take any trips and go to their clinics physically, uh, it's included in the season pass. So figure out a way to, to get that. Uh, I'll take a look here real quick to see if there's any questions.
Thoughts on cadence changes uh, for field goal. Uh, my thought is this, is points are on the line. So don't be too creative. All right. But at the same time, if you do the same thing over and over and over, they're going to time it. Okay. So we do this is we have our normal cadence. <clears throat> um, and we go through our T10, like, a, like a lot of people do. I didn't really talk about that. Um, but it'll be, you know, the T10 call is relative to the, the time on the play clock. Okay. So if there's 12 seconds, it'd be T12, T12 ready. O lineman hands go down on the ready. Look, and the holder looks back to the kicker. Kicker gives him a nod or a wink and a gun or whatever it is that they have between each other to say that he's ready. Then the holder looks back, set. And then the long snapper snaps the ball after a short pause. Uh, everyone goes on the ball. Long snapper des determines when that ball is snapped after the, after the set call. So it's T12, T12, ready. Set. And then the ball will come out. Then we'll go deuce. Okay, we'll go on two. Okay, uh, we'll go on two. And we all also, so it'll be T12, T12, ready, set, pause, set again. All right. And then we'll tap the T uh, in a noise situation. If you're on the road dealing with noise, okay, we'll tap the T and we'll also use that just for a change of pace so they can't really uh, get any cadence. Uh, jump on us. But the number one thing is don't let them time you. And everyone is going on the football. Okay. Don't, you, you're not going on a set go. Another question here says with your special teams goals, you mentioned penalty busters, penalty beaters. Yes. Drills to help teach, uh, help you reach your goal of eliminating penalties. Can you elaborate on some of the drills you do? Penalty beaters, um, a rip by, for example, on punt return is a, is a penalty beater. So you don't want to take blocks in the backs on punt return, okay? Teaching decision making. So you teach them how to use a rip by, teach them the plant and drive, like Coach uh, uh, Miguel went over last week, okay? In that decision phase, those are two easy examples of penalty beaters re right there. Resetting your hands, okay? You know, it's basically the term penalty beater is to use the proper teaching technique uh, to execute your assignment or make your decision. And the best two examples of that right there are, uh, pe uh, are uh, the rip by and the um, plant and climb. And then on the cover game, uh, you also got your halo on punt team. Okay, so doing your halo drill. That's a good question. Um, how do you manage the unknown injuries for special teams practice during the week? I.e., you don't know if a player is dressing or not. Okay, that's a problem with everybody. Okay. So especially with special teams coaches, um, because we're moving, all right? Especially if you do something where you practice it early in the week and then don't practice it again till late in the week, all right? But what we like to do is, especially later in the season, it, it depends who's injured. If it's later in the season and the person who's injured is one of your prime players, like for example, I was pumping up Beltre in, in an earlier clinic for us last year, Beltre could come off the bus and play. All right, he's going to be studying, he's going to be learning, he's attentive in meetings, he's watching practice if he's able to, okay, so you have that, and then you get your backups, their reps, okay, you get the backups, their reps, if the starter is good to go, and everyone is confident that he's going to contribute to the team and not be an injury risk, uh, then you can do that. But the key thing here is to rotate reps. If you only have your starters taking the reps, then you're not developing the next guy, okay? Everyone talks about, you know, next man up and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's easy to say. It's harder to do, especially on special teams where you have limited reps. So if you have five reps, maybe it's four reps for the starters and one rep for the backups. But you have to keep those guys going. So we, we like to talk about the adaptable fighting force, all right? We have to be able to adjust to this stuff. So when players have unknown injuries, uh, or let me back up. When players have injuries through the week, okay, we're getting the backups in. We're asking backups questions in meetings, okay? If it's player X that's making a mistake or something good on film, ask the backup to explain why it was that it happened. Or, or instead of using the word why, uh, what was done correctly in order to get that result or what was done incorrectly uh, and what you would fix. So you keep them attentive so they can go. And I do want to double check that one there. Uh, 
and it, yeah, you've got your depth charts. Uh, what we do is you've got, we, we go three deep. The depth charts I showed you were only two deep, I think. During the week, we go three deep. And then for game, we go two deep. Uh, and then that way you've got more people invested. You know, one of those guys who might be, you know, a, a, a third guy on the depth chart or second guy on the depth chart could end up starting, but they get to see it. So chances are the third guys aren't going to uh, get reps, but they will be attentive and you can still ask them questions in the meeting. But we got to be fluid with that. What are your thoughts on putting your best players on special teams versus uh, all backups on O&D? My mindset is this, best players play, okay? Best players play. If you have a culture on your team where none of your star players contribute on special teams, what does that say about the importance of special teams, okay? It sends a bad message. So it doesn't matter if it's an all-star player or something like that, those guys have to contribute somehow. So a good rule of thumb is your starters can play a maximum of two. I mean, heck, it wasn't lo long ago in the CFL, you know, where starters would play with smaller rosters would play three or four, okay? Now two is a big ask, but all starters should play at least one. And for your ones that, you, you know, you might have your quarterbacks are off limit. You know, if, you're, if it's pay to play football, you might have a contract that says this guy's off limit, but talent shouldn't take these guys off limit, okay? Get these guys involved. And if it's one thing, Challenge them and get them to own it and give them a significant role, okay? If it's two things, get them to own it, give them a significant role and get them to buy in, okay? Because hopefully they come from your culture where they were a backup that busted their hump on special teams to get to where they're at now and they're still going back and playing special teams. That's what we want. But I don't like teams that say uh, it's all backups. Um. Anything else? Going once, going twice. I don't see anything else. So again, thank you guys. Appreciate it uh, for tuning in. Um, and hopefully you got something out of, out of it. If you need to get a hold of me, go ahead. Uh, I welcome that. Would love to talk to you. And uh, hope everyone stays safe out there. And enjoy the rest of your night. Take care. Thank you.